Greetings, everyone. I'm Erin Devonport, the Interim Director of the American Indian Studies Center. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The AISC and UCLA acknowledge the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands, and are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarahatong indigenous peoples in this place. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to Honokvatam, the ancestors, Ahirihom, the elders, and Ayu Hinkam, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. In honor of the talk we will be hearing today, I also want to acknowledge Tongva as the traditional language spoken where I am today and invite everyone here, wherever you are, to also consider the rich indigenous linguistic landscapes that are part of the places where you live and work. It is my distinct pleasure to now introduce Dr. Rodrigo Ranero. Dr. Ranero is a UC Chancellor's postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Linguistics and in the American Indian Studies Center, where he's working with faculty mentors, Dr. Harold Torrance and Dr. Shannon Speed, respectively. He received his PhD in linguistics from the University of Maryland College Park his Master's of Philosophy in Theoretical and Applied Linguistics from Cambridge University, and his BA in Cognitive Sciences and Linguistics from Pomona College. Dr. Ranero has research interests that span several areas of linguistics, including morphosyntax, which is how words and sentences are formed across languages, phonology, the sound systems that are found across languages, and most importantly for our purposes here today, language reclamation, documentation, and revitalization. He continues to publish in linguistics journals, as well as co-author pedagogical language materials with his community collaborators. I'm especially excited to welcome Dr. Ranero to speak for an American Indian Studies audience, as many students and faculty here are involved in community language projects in their home communities and or part of their research projects. I think that you'll notice important parallels between the Shinka experience that Rodrigo is going to discuss and others whose linguistic practices have shifted following the imposition of settler languages. Following the presentation, I will moderate a Q&A discussion and I will also attempt to integrate comments and questions from the chat. We will post a recording of the event on our YouTube channel later. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rodrigo Ranero, who will be giving a presentation entitled The Reclamation of Xinca in Guatemala. Thank you, Erin, so much for that introduction. Um, can everybody hear me well? Yes, excellent. So before we get started, I would like to make an invitation for all the attendees here to write in the chat what languages they have some connection to. Eve. It could be that you grew up speaking that language, you're interested in learning that language, or your community uh, has a heritage language that you are looking to work with. I'm going to be the first to do that. I'm going to write in the chat all the languages that I am interested in, the communities that I work with, and I invite you to do that as well so that we see the range of linguistic connections that are here with us today. And I'm going to now um, share some slides so that we get started. And like Aaron said, I am going to be talking about the reclamation of Xinca in Guatemala. Is everybody able to see the slides? Are the slides moving? Yes, okay. Yes, so that, me that means that we're right, that everything is working. Sometimes you, things happen. All right. So I'd like to acknowledge that whenever we talk about language, we're just not, we're not just talking about language. So I'd like to start with a little note that came out in Prensa Comunitaria, which is a community-based newspaper in Guatemala in July 26, 2017, in, a, in an article entitled, Where are the Xinca? Okay. And this is an opinion piece that was written by the author where the author talks about a group of Shinka activists who got together in Guatemala City. And I'm gonna read you some portions of that article and the translation is mine. 
Last week, approximately 5,000 Shinkas from Eastern Guatemala marched on the streets of Guatemala City under the banner, Yo Soy Shinka, I am Shinka. In front of Congress, taking a microphone, a Shinka leader asked, where are the Shinka? Thousands of them responded, here, here. I was moved by seeing a Shinka woman holding two books, one book, Grammar, Morphology of the Shinka Language, and another, Consonants and Vowels, Guide to Orthography and Pronunciation. And here's a picture that accompanied that news story. And we're gonna get back to these specific textbooks that you see here and the kind of um, what these textbooks represent to some members of the Shinka community. There are some takeaways that I want us to uh, go away with today for our talk. And since we're on Zoom, I, I want these to put these really up front since I know it's sometimes hard to keep up when we're in this digital space. But what I want us to discuss today are the following. First, I want to highlight that Kopshig was the first Shinka organization to do research on and disseminate the cultural practices of their people, the Shinka being a minoritized indigenous community among minoritized communities in Guatemala. We're going to delve a little more into this as we go on. Also, the linguistic reclamation is a key component of Kopshig and other Shinka organizations' goal of gaining sociopolitical recognition in Guatemala. However, we're gonna see that unfiltered linguistic documentation really is of limited use for a community whose language is described therein. And I'm gonna hopefully show us that linguists can support linguistic reclamation by making documentation accessible and by providing advice, keeping in mind that every community's sociolinguistic context is unique. Okay. So these are our takeaways for the day. And this is how we're gonna get there. I'm gonna start with some background on the Shinka people of Guatemala. Then we're gonna delve into the language. In section three, I'm gonna talk about the collaboration that Kompshig and I initiated 10 years ago now. And I'll end with some prospects and challenges for where to take the project and where we're going. Okay. So let's start with some background on the Shinka people and specifically in issues related to language. So the Shinka are one of 22 indigenous peoples whose land is situated in present day Guatemala. If we look at a map of Guatemala, here's a linguistic map of Guatemala. And each of these colors represents uh, different linguistic communities. The only language not shown here is Guatemalan Sign Language, which is used throughout the country. This part of the country that you see here in green, these are Mayan linguistic communities. Okay? These are Maya people who speak distinct Mayan languages. And if we look at a tree from the Mayan family, which we see here, uh, about 30 languages spoken in Mexico, Guatemala, present-day Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and Honduras, as well as a significant immigrant population in the U.S. About 20 of these languages are spoken in Guatemala, okay, which we see here in red. And if we look at um, official census numbers regarding uh, the number of people who grew up speaking one of these languages in Guatemala, we get a big range of numbers, for instance, over a million speakers for Quiche and about a hundred um, for a language like Itza. So a big range in the reported numbers of folks who grew up speaking these languages. If we return to the map of Guatemala, we see again the linguistic communities who speak a Mayan language but there are two linguistic communities in Guatemala who are non-Mayan. And I'm going to make this distinction of being Mayan and non-Mayan because it's gonna play a role when we look at the specific issues that issues and opportunities of the Shinka community. The first is Garifuna, the community here in the department of Izabal that we see here uh, next to the Atlantic Ocean. And the Garifuna speak an Arawakan language. And down here in the Southeast, we find Shinka. In this map, just marked with this small little triangle. Now, the Shinka territory spans three departments in present day Guatemala the Department of Santa Rosa, here, Utiapa, and Jalapa. Just going to show those again to you here. Now, the Shinka people, if we're just talking about governmental recognition, 
They were first recognized officially by the Guatemalan government in 1995 with the signing of what's called the Agreement on the Identity and Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was included in the 1996 peace accords, which officially ended 36 years of civil war in the country. And I'm gonna show you a portion of that agreement with my translation so that you see the kind of language that was included in that agreement. And we're gonna think about how it relates to the Xinka people specifically. So the agreement says, the identity of the peoples is a conjunction of elements that define them and at the same time makes them recognize themselves as such with regards to Mayan identity, which has demonstrated a capacity of secular resistance to assimilation, the following are fundamental elements. Direct descendants from the ancient Maya, languages that come from a common Mayan source, and also a common culture based on the principles and structures of Mayan thought. And I've omitted a couple of the other elements here, but I just wanna highlight these because what they show us is that even though the agreement recognized the Xinka and Garifuna peoples, the criteria, regardless of what we think of them, that were included them, uh, that uh, were the criteria that define self-identification as an indigenous population, were geared towards the Mayan population. And from that agreement and other developments at the end of the 90s, organizations were founded that supported the, the, the research and work on Mayan languages and also the dissemination of grammars of Mayan languages and bilingual education was instituted in the, language, in the country. For instance, the Academia de Lenguas Mayas de Guatemala was founded around this time and still plays an active role in Guatemala politics and also in the teaching of Mayan languages in the school system. And bilingual education was also established across the, across the country. Okay. When, the, when this agreement came out, it inspired the founding of El Consejo Coordinador del Pueblo Xinca de Guatemala, COPSHIG, in 1996 in the town of Chiquimulia. Here is their logo. And here is a uh, Going back to the map of Guatemala, the, the Department of Santa Rosa where Chiquimulia is found. And this is the, the, the ethos of Kopshig. When they talk about the Shinka movement, they say that the modern Shinka movement is searching for its cultural roots as the basis on which to establish the political spaces from which to propose, according to its vision, policies of well-being and development for all the peoples who live together in the country. Kopshik members became the first self-identifying Shinka to work towards the documentation and reclamation of their language. There had been prior documentation of the Shinkan languages going back to the 18th century with the Arte de la Lengua Shinka, which we'll get to in a second. And others like work by Otto Schumann and Lyle Campbell and Karen Kaufman, linguists who are outsiders to the Shinka community. Here's a picture of some of my Shinka colleagues who I've been collaborating with for the last 10 years. This is in 2013, when we, the second year of our collaboration. And I really want to highlight uh, one member of the Shinka community, uh, Demetrio Lopez de la Cruz, who was a key figure in the founding of Kopshig and was there from the start, uh, working towards the reclamation of Shinka, both the language and also of other cultural aspects of the community. Now, starting in the late 1990s with the founding of Kopshig, members of Kopshig carried out interviews with heritage speakers of Xinca like Julian de la Cruz, and later linguist Frauke Saxe began to collaborate with Kopshig as well. So let's look at some of the documentation that forms the empirical basis of the Xinca's com community's reclamation efforts. The first that we're gonna come back to in a second, um, in the later part of the, of the talk, is this dissertation by Frauke Saxe reconstructed description of 18th century Xinca grammar, which is based on an 18th century manuscript, Arte la Lengua Xinca, and also interviews that were supervised by Kopshig, which were carried out in the early 2000s with heritage speakers of Xinca in Chiquimulia and in Guasacapan, two Xinca towns. And another piece of work that I want to highlight is uh, the following book by Chris Rogers uh, from 2016, The Use and Development of the Xinca Languages which is mostly based on notes by Lyle Campbell and Terence Kaufman from the 1970s. 
And these are two works that we're gonna come back to once we discuss the language. So to summarize some of the background that I gave you on the, on the Xinka people and their language, their territory encompasses the Eastern departments of Santa Rosa, Jutiapa, and Jalapa. When the 1996 peace accords were signed, there was official recognition provided for the Xinka from the government. And we can, um, you know, that's one aspect that I want to highlight. Of course, it doesn't mean that this made, made it so that the Xinka recognized themselves as indigenous, but it was an important step within the socio-political situation in Guatemala. But we saw that the wording in that document was centered around the Maya population. Also, we saw that Kapshik was the first Shinka organization to devote itself to cultural and linguistic reclamation. And one of the key goals of linguistic reclamation for the Shinka community was sociopolitical recognition in Guam. And this is something that we're going to get back to again. So now that we've talked about some background about the Shinka people, we're going to delve into the Shinka language. Let's recall first the agreement on the identity and rights of indigenous peoples that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And again, I'm showing it here. And like I highlighted at the beginning, this agreement was really centered around um, the Maya populations in the country, which formed the majority of the indigenous population and the majority of people in the country. And one key aspect here is the importance given to language. So in a way, as a response to this agreement, the reclamation of the Shinka language has become a central goal of the community as one of the means to attain political and socioeconomic participation in post-war Guatemala. And we understand language reclamation to be efforts by indigenous communities to claim the right to speak their heritage languages. This is the definition that Wesley Leonard provides. Now, if we look at some facts about the Shinka language, it is a linguistic isolate. What this means is that it is impossible to determine whether Shinka is related to any other language family. In a nutshell, the kind of tools that linguists use to group languages into distinct families and to map out the relationship between families, those tools are not sensitive enough for us to know in the present day when Shinka branched off from some other linguistic family. So today it's impossible to determine the relationship of Shinka to other languages in Mesoamerica on the, or the world. Other linguistic isolates you might have heard of, for instance, is Basque in, in, spoken in, in present day Spain. That's a linguistic isolate as well. Chris Ryers argues that there are four distinct Shinkan languages, not just one. Guasacapan Shinka, Chiquimulia Shinka, Humaitepeque Shinka, and Yupiltepeque Shinka. And it's argued that these languages have limited mutual intelligibility. But today I'm going to keep referring to the language simply as Shinka, given the desire to standardize one of the Shinkan varieties. And we're going to look at some Shinka sentences. And for us to, to see the structure of the language, we're going to see why we do that. And the data that we're going to show are created based on the standard that is proposed in the textbooks that Kopshiga and I developed that we're gonna to get to later on in the talk. So let's start with a simple Shinka sentence that I'm going to pronounce. This is the orthography in which Shinka is written that uh, Kopshiga and I proposed. The translation for this sentence is, I saw the dogs. This is a simple sentence. So when we look at uh, linguistic data like these, just sentences in the language, right? What linguists do to break down this sentence to figure out what the parts are that compose the sentence is to provide what we see here, a word breakdown, which we see here in this first line. And we see as well a morpheme meaning line where each of the little components that make up words is given its own contribution. So for instance, we see here that in Shinka, piring, we get the verb C and then this N at the end is verbal agreement, first singular verbal agreement. Na is an article, sort of equivalent to the in the language and translation. And this achle, 
morpheme here at the end is plural. So, pelo, dog, pelo, actually, dogs. So, just from this one simple Shinka sentence, now I'm going to turn it to the audience to see if there's anybody who is brave enough to, to, for us to, to exchange some ideas. Just from looking at this one simple Shinka sentence, pirina pelo ajenen, what can we observe about the Shinka language? Just from this sentence, what is something that you notice here? You can type in the chat or you can, you can unmute yourself if you wish. Well, it seems like the the word order is different, very different than maybe in English and span and between English, Spanish, and Shinka. Yeah, that was exactly what I was trying to get. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so, one aspect about the Shinkan language is that the word order, the basic order, is verb, object, subject. So, in a sentence like this, we get first the verb pidin, then the object, and then the subject. Okay, so this is a fact about the syntax of Shinka, how sentences are put together, okay? Let's look at two more sentences and then we're gonna circle back to why we're actually doing this. Okay? So let's see how you form a simple Shinka question. Shukaka ikase manaka, you ate a fish. And then another one, kashuka ikase manaka, you're eating a fish. So these are two different Shinka questions. There's a difference in meaning here. The first one is you ate a fish. And number three is you're eating a fish. And this is the breakdown of the parts that make up these sentences. Now this is gonna be a little trickier than the previous question. So let's see if somebody is willing to give us some, some notion of what seems to be happening here. What seems to regulate this difference in meaning that we observe? The difference between you ate a fish versus you're eating a fish. What seems to be uh, the way that you mark this meaning difference in Shinka? So I'll give you the sentence in two again, and three as you're thinking through this. Sentence two, shukaka ikase manaka. And three, kashuka ikase manaka. Does anybody have any, any proposals about what seems to be how Shinka syntax seems to work in this one. So we have somebody in the chat. Ah, tense indicated with prefix or particle. Good, yes, this, this is on the right track, exactly. So what you've noticed is that there's, 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 a, there's a tense aspect difference here, the difference between you ate a fish versus you're eating a fish. And the way that you seem to get at this difference in Shinka is the following. So, if you conjugate the verb with this suffix, right, this part after the verb, shukaka, then that means that the event in this sentence, the eating event is done, it's finished. But if you do the conjugation with a prefix, so another, uh, a, a part before the verb, kashuka, then the event isn't finished. So that's how you get your eating fish. So in linguistic jargon, this means that Shinka has an aspect-based split. Well, let's, not, let's not bother with the linguistic jargon, but exactly what, what Joy shared with us is on the right track. Now, you might be wondering at this point why we're breaking down Shinka sentences to see how the language works, right? You might be thinking, why are we doing this, right? Especially because these seem to be sentences that are taken out of context. They mean something in Shinka, but I didn't give you a discourse context, such as, and, one might reply, well, because language and Shinka grammar is interesting in itself. So that could be a reason you could give. But I think there's a more important reason why we're doing this. So we said that Shinka is a linguistic isolate. We cannot determine its relationship to any other language family. And furthermore, today, there are only heritage learners of Shinka. Okay. So this status of the Shinka language it's a linguistic isolate and a linguistic situation with our heritage learners. Also the fact that Shinka has played a much less prominent role than the Mayan languages when discussing the linguistic situation in Guatemala has led to skepticism about the language. 
So to illustrate this, I'm gonna cite from Frauke Sachs's work where she describes a meeting that was had with members of the Guatemalan Ministry of Education in 2003, where she alongside with Kopchik members presented facts about Shinkan grammar, much like what we just did. And what Saxe says is that attendees expressed their honest astonishment about the material because they believed that the language had been invented by the Shinka. What I want us to get at by looking at just simple sentences is that the language was not invented by the Shinka. Shinkan language exists. And we can talk about the grammar and the structure of the Shinkan language, much like we can talk about any other linguistic uh, community in Guatemala or around the world. So some of the aspects of Shinka that we delved into were VOS word order and also an aspect-based split in person marking. Okay. We're going to delve into another aspect of Shinka language because we're going to circle back to why this is important and also how it relates to the way that linguists talk about minoritized languages and why it's important to document, revitalize, or reclaim these languages. So we're going to talk about some phonology now, some, some, some sound system, issues related to sound, not syntax. So Shinka possesses a unique restriction on vowel co-occurrence. And we can think about what that means. We're gonna go into it really, really slowly. What this means is that when it comes to simple Shinka words, they come in three groups. Okay. The first group is words that have the vowels i, u, a. So like hiru, monkey, shuka, bite, body, day. Group two are words that come with the vowels e, o, a. Like pelo, dog, one, baby, or astepet, town. And group three are, are words that have this mid-central, uh, this central high vowel e or a. So pukke, pukta, sma. Okay, so the language allows these three types of words. Now, if we think about the, the oral cavity, the human oral cavity and where we pronounce vowels, here's a, here's a diagram. Imagine that this is a person, right? And this is where vowels are pronounced. Thank you to the blog All Things Linguistic for this image. If we zoom in on the kinds of vowels that exist in the world's languages, these are the vowels that we find across the world's languages. A lot of different vowels, okay? And imagine that this is our, our mouth when we're talking about spoken languages, and we have vowels that are pronounced to the front of the mouth, central and back, and also vowels that are pronounced high, mid, and low, okay? So these, this is the vowel space that we find in, in human languages. And of course, not all languages have all these vowels, right? But a subset of these. Now, if we look at the first group of words in Shinka group one that allows for i, u, a, okay? This word group allows for the high vowels, i and u, and also this central low vowel, a, all right? So this is the description of what's allowed in this word group. Group two allows the mid vowels, a, o, and again, a, this mid central vowel, this uh, low central vowel. And then there's group three, which allows a uh and a. Uh. So this is sort of the description of what is happening with these three groups of vowels, okay? Now, there are two facts about the Shinka vowel system that are unusual. By that, we mean that they're typologically not found very often. So if we look across languages, this sort of system where we have a restriction on the vowels for simple words has two facts that make it unusual. One, that there's the central low vowel that's able to co-occur with all other vowels. And two, so there's the first fact that a occurs in all groups. And the second fact is that e, a high vowel, can't co-occur with other high vowels. E, U. So this central high vowel U, also behaves in a manner that we wouldn't expect given how languages uh, work around the world. As far as we know, and as far as Palazari and Campbell argue, this vowel co-occurrence restriction we find in Shinka is unique among the world's languages. 
And Palisario and Campbell argued that the existence of these kinds of unique patterns that exist only in one language, for instance, is one of the reasons why documenting, revitalizing, or reclaiming minoritized languages is important. And this is a, a, an argument that's commonly made in the linguistic literature for why this sort of uh, research on minoritized languages is important in itself, right? This is one of the claims that are made. But what I want to highlight here is that in fact, the Shinka people have taken grammatical facts like these and used them to assert their difference from other peoples in Guatemala, including the Mayan population. Facts about their language has become useful for sociopolitical purposes. And once again, here I'm going to cite uh, somebody else who has worked with the Shinka community for many years, in this case, Chris Rogers, who talks about workshops that he's led in Guatemala with Shink the members of the Shinka community, where this aspect of the language, of the heritage language of the Shinka has been described in detail and has been explained. And this is what Rogers says. Citing a member, a community member in Guasacapan who, 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 who is reclaiming his heritage language. And this, this community member says, it's very interesting. I don't, want to, I don't think I understand it all or why my language is like that, but it is clearly different than languages like Cachiquel or Spanish. This is important to help the community understand that it is unique, that we are Shinka. So I want to highlight this because it shows how specific aspects of the structure of a language when they are made accessible to the community who's working to reclaim their language can really highlight those differences and unique aspects of the community as there is a project of reconstructing and reclaiming cultural heritage as well. And this is not usually a perspective that's given when just facts about the grammar of languages are discussed, but I think it's an important one to highlight in this context. So to summarize what we've learned about uh, the Shinka language via these, you know, when we looked at aspects of the grammar of Shinka, when it came to syntactic structure, and when we looked at also the sound system of Shinka, this is what we've learned. We learned that Shinka is a linguistic isolate with certain grammatical characteristics that distinguish it from the other languages of linguistic communities in Guatemala and perhaps from every other linguistic community in the world. For instance, the vowel co-occurrence restriction that we saw. The Shinka language we observed has been met with skepticism. And that skepticism has some of its roots in the fact that the language is an isolate and that a broad membership of many in the community are heritage learners. So the dissemination of facts about Shinka grammar in an accessible way can help challenge these views. Furthermore, we saw that grammatical facts about Shinka have become markers of Shinka identity construction within the Shinka movement, which we can date to the mid 90s, but in reality dates many decades earlier when people in present day Shinka territory self-identified as indigenous, even before the signing of that agreement that I've been bringing up over and over again. So now that we've learned about the Shinka community in relation to language and also the language itself. I wanna talk a little about the collaboration that I've had the privilege to have with Kopshig for now 10 years. So we're gonna delve into that collaboration and see some of the results and the reasons why the project looks the way it does, what the goals of the project are, which tie into the discussion we've been having, and also some of the some of the issues that somebody like me, who's an outsider linguist, can come in to advise a community on when it comes to linguistic reclamation. So let's talk about this collaboration. So 10 years ago now, I can't believe 2022, uh, I got in touch with Frauke Sachse, who, who, who we talked about previously, who had published a dissertation on Shinka a few years prior. This is the dissertation. Uh, reconstructive description of 18th century Shinka grammar, which is an analysis of a 1770 manuscript detailing Shinka grammar. And this work was supplemented with work 
that Rauke Sachse and Kapschik members carried out with heritage speakers in the early 2000s in Chikimuli and Wasakapan, two of the, the Shinka towns today. Now, Sachse put me in touch with Kapschik member Juan Pablo Lopez, and I learned that the community was looking for a linguist to support them in making Sachse's work usable. Now, a disclaimer here, I wasn't a linguist yet at the time. I was an undergraduate student at Pomona College, but I was able to get some funding to be able to support Kapschig in this process, and in the process also received some support from Kapschika linguist Lolmai Pedro Garcia Matza, who, who was also a key part of this collaboration at the beginning. So I received summer and winter research funding and traveled to Chiquimulia in Guatemala, my home country, but a town that's not my hometown. And I began to work at the Kopshig offices with the members of Kopshig from 2012 to 2015 in C2 work in Chiquimulia. Okay? And the funding for that work I wanna acknowledge came from Davis Projects for Peace and the Donald A. Strauss Foundation. And for people here who are from UCLA, UCLA undergraduates are eligible for the Donald Strauss Foundation Scholarship. So if you're interested in that, let me know because they have supported linguistic work in the past. Okay? And from 2020 onwards, remotely, this, this collaboration has been reignited and we'll see how the kind of, of, of ethos that we have with our collaboration allow for that dynamic interaction where an outsider linguist support comes whenever the community wants that support, right? And also importantly, the community is able to carry on with a project independently, which is a very important um, goal, I think, that linguistic work should strive towards. And our remote work today is supported by two, or two organizations, uh, primarily, Cooperativa El Recuerdo in San Pedro Pinula, Jalapa, which is a Shinka cooperative made uh, composed mostly of Shinka women and also the Ministry of Culture and Sports from the Guatemalan government. And we're gonna get at a little bit more about this at the end of the talk. Okay. So here is a picture of one of the editions of the Shinka textbooks that we published, Gramatica Shinka. And this, was, this became one of the standard textbooks that is used in the Shinka region for teaching Shinka in the primary school system. So, our goals in this collaboration that we started in 2012 have been the following. To publish pedagogical material that is accessible, meaning that it's usable for school teachers and understandable for school children who are learning their heritage language. Our goal was to introduce the teaching of Shinka into the public school system in the Shinka region, so Santa Rosa, Jutiapa, and Jalapa. And also to raise awareness about the Shinka language in order to combat the skepticism and discrimination faced that the community based in part because of the specific sociolinguistic situation of Shinka in relation to the other uh, indigenous communities of Guatemala, mostly Mayan speaking communities. Now, one of my roles has been to advise on the structure of the textbooks and co-write them alongside Kapshik members. So it's part of the, 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 the kind of structure that we've given to the series of textbooks is that they start basically uh, inside out from the, the smallest parts of the language into the larger parts of the language. So the first textbook that we published proposes a standard orthography and delves into the pronunciation of the Shinka language. The second textbook deals with word formation and morphology because the language has a very complex system of word formation. And then when we get to the textbooks that focus on syntax, then those can really build on the on what's been established with the prior textbooks. So it's sort of this very linguistically oriented kind of approach to teaching a language where we understand that given the sociolinguistic situation of Shinka, this is a good way of allowing people who are reclaiming their language to be able to understand from the smaller parts of the language to the larger parts of the language, how the language, uh, how the language's grammar works. So here is a picture of the first edition of the Shinka textbooks that we published in those first initial years of our collaboration. And I return once more to the, one of the initial pictures that we started with of a Shinka community member here who is showing 
uh, later edition of these works in 2017, once they began to be disseminated in the community and began to be used as a means of teaching and as a component within the reclamation of sheep. So I'm going to now zoom into one of the many issues regarding the standardization of Shinka that have arisen in our discussions with Kopshi and which I, as an outsider linguist, have been able to advise. Okay. So here's another fact about Shinka. Okay. Every word in Shinka starts with a consonant. Okay. What this means is that we can have words in Shinka like in four, seema, fish, urak, person, mishtum, cat. This is the pronunciation in IPA. So this is a linguistic alphabet that's used that gives you a precise description of the pronunciation of specific sounds. And these pronunciations, now we see the orthography that's proposed on the right, sema, hurak, mishtum. So an orthography is always gonna be, uh, uh, an orthography is not always gonna encode all the subtleties of pronunciation that a language might have. So certain choices have to be made about what's represented in the orthography, even though we know that there are certain uh, um, uh, aspects about pronunciation that aren't reflected. Okay. okay, so all of these words start with a consonant, S, H, or M. Now there's another group of words in Shinka that start with this little consonant that we find here. So we have One, child, Ayashla, woman, Ikash, one. There are no vowel initial words in Shinka. So in the, in the way the language works is that a glottal stop is always inserted at the beginning of a word if there's a vowel at the beginning. Now you might be wondering what's a glottal stop? We're all familiar with English. So I'm gonna give you an example of English that has a, a glottal stop. So the word uh-oh in English, that little stop between uh and o oh, that we mark with a dash in English, that's a glottal stop, uh-oh. And that's a consonantal sound. That is actually a consonant. Okay, so now zooming out. So this is what this consonant is. Okay, we actually have it in, in, in language like English, even though we might not be conscious of it. Should this glottal stop be represented in the orthography? This is a question that was raised during the discussions over the years between Kopshik members and myself regarding how to write the language. Should we represent this glottal stop in the orthography? So I'm gonna pose this question to have you think a little bit, hmm, should we do this or not? But you might be thinking, well, I don't have enough to go on to know whether this should be done or not. So I'm gonna now contrast what we see in Shinka with another language of Guatemala, a Mayan language, Mam. Now in the Mayan languages, some of the Mayan languages, there's a similar process where a glottal stop isn't represented in the orthography, but occurs at the beginning of words that seem to start with a vowel, okay? So, so in the Mayan languages, even though they're not related to Shin, right? We see a similar kind of process in the sound system. So if we look at the tree from the Mayan family once more, we're gonna talk a little about Mam, uh, a language spoken in Guatemala, where if you look at the official census numbers, you'll find over half a million people grew up speaking Mam as their first language. So a very different sociolinguistic situation than Shink. Now, some mam words appear to be vowel initial, but they actually have a glottal stop. So if you look at two words in mam, a and u, water and paper, okay? There's a difference here because in the pronunciation, there is this consonant at the beginning of the word, you might, be, you might be finding it hard to listen to a consonant. I, I don't blame you if you can't really listen to a consonant. It's really easy to listen to a glottal stop when the word preceding it ends in a vowel. Then it's really clear to hear a, a glottal stop. So don't worry if you're not able to hear it, but I think in, in this sense, you can trust me that there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a consonant there. What I want you to see though, is that the orthography doesn't represent this initial glottal stop. 
what we see is that in MAM, when it comes to the standard orthography in which the language is written, we get something like in green, where the, vowel, where the word starts with the vowel, but we don't get a marker before the vowel signaling that there's a consonant there. So in the case of MAM, the orthography does not show the glottal stop. Okay. All right, let's go, go back to Shinka. Now that I've, we've discussed what another community decided when it came to standardizing their language. And we're gonna talk about this again. Should this initial glottal stop be represented in the orthography? And now I'm gonna ask the audience members again, maybe somebody has an idea, should we represent it or not in the report? I don't think there's gonna be a correct answer here, but maybe somebody has an idea of why we would or wouldn't represent the glottal stop in the report. Again, feel free to, to jump in if, if you want, or to write in the chat. I'll give you a, a, a few seconds. I'll tell you what, what we decided in the end, so, so don't worry. I'm not gonna just leave this as a mystery. Right? I'll go ahead and guess. Okay. I seem to be the um, unofficial linguistic nerd in the audience here. Thanks everyone for, <laughs> but I, I, it seems like it's been really important, right, for um, them to, for Shinka people to distinguish themselves from Maya people for very important reasons, you know, right? And so it seems like if mom is using it, then maybe Shinka folks might want to not use it, right? Right, or vice versa. Okay. Where there's okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. There could be a reason where we see, okay, what is what became the standard orthography for another language from an indigenous community in the country, and then there's a way to distinguish ourselves from them, right? And they could be via the choices made here, right? So you're right that the choice was made to represent the glottal stop in the orthography. So the, in the proposal that we made together, and which I advised on, eventually it was decided that the gloss up be represented. So if you see any, any, every word in Shinka is gonna start with a consonant in the orthography as well. And this is against proposals made by folks like Chris Rogers, who has also worked with different Shinka communities as well. And the reasoning that was done in order to do this is that when it comes to heritage learners of Shinka, this phonological aspect of the language where you always have a consonant at the beginning of words that seem to start with a vowel, really emphasizing that in the orthography allows for the learners to really understand that this is a productive rule in the system that really is different from a language like Spanish, for instance, that they grew up speaking, right? So when it comes to reclaiming their language, there's this very distinct phonological aspect of it that given the situation of Shinka, it was decided it should be reflected in the orthography. Very different from the case of Man, right? Where as we said in the official census, over half a million people grew up speaking Man. There's no issue about um, Man speakers, they, they know the sound system of their language, right? So the orthography, it, there's a better argument there for the orthography not to reflect every little sound distinction in the language, right? Whereas for Shinka, given the sociolinguistic situation, one of the reasonings that were given was a practical one. Okay? And also, as Aaron pointed out, there's also this desire to differentiate Shinka from other communities in the country as well. All right. Our project has also been focused on long-term sustainability. Basically, if this smiley face is myself, who is an outsider linguist, who is advising the community, and 
my one of my roles is to train and to advise members of the community, for instance, who are members of Kopshig within their language reclamation goals, then Kopshig members can transfer the knowledge that was attained during those interactions with me to other members of the Shinka community. Right? So once we have published this work and we disseminated this work, then it can be transferred, this knowledge and this training can be transferred to school teachers, to students and to community members. So this kind of long-term sustainability where the role of an outsider linguist is to ensure the long-term sustainability um, was really a priority within our collaboration. So here we see some pictures here of Canet Felipe de la Cruz leading a, a workshop on the language. This was following those, during and following that initial collaboration in 2012 to 2015. And here we see a picture of public school teachers who have gone through a series of language related workshops with Kapshik members and who are now able to use the material and then transfer that knowledge about their heritage language to school children in the Shinka region. Another picture here of Juan Pablo Lopez working with Shinka children. We chose this methodology because it minimizes the need for an outsider linguist to be it minimizes the need for having somebody who is from outside the community to be present at all times for the language reclamation effort to continue. The language reclamation effort has to be led by community members themselves. And I am of the opinion that a linguist role can be to provide the kind of tools that are necessary for that to be carried forward. And it also allows for the support of linguists to be dynamic. For instance, I come back to the project when advice is needed to continue on to the next stage, if such advice is necessary. But it really ensures that a language reclamation effort like Kopshik's can be driven from within the community itself. So now to summarize our collaboration, my collaboration with Kopshik members. Now in a decade long collaboration, which again, I just, it's shocking to me, it's 2022. Uh, between Kapshig and I has resulted in a successful introduction of Shinka teaching into the public school system, which is not the ultimate goal of all language reclamation efforts, right? But it can be a component of a language reclamation effort. And we saw that if we take this project as a case study, my role as an outsider linguist has to be provide advice and training, supporting the long-term and independent sustainability of a language reclamation effort like Kupshiks. And this methodology really allows for a dynamic collaboration. And this project, I hope, shows that linguists can collaborate with communities and help them advance in their linguistic reclamation goals, which then feed into broader goals such as sociopolitical recognition and advancement. Again, this is within the specific sociocultural context of Guatemala, but I think these kinds of lessons and, and this case study can inform other sociolinguistic contexts as well. And I'd be happy to answer questions about that in the question period. So to end, I want to go over some prospects and challenges of where we are now and where we're going. So I think both Kapshig members and other uh, members of the Shinka community and I are happy that the reclamation project has been taken over by other Shinka organizations as well, like Cooperativa El Recuerdo, whose members have now taken the textbooks we created and published their own material that comes from that basis that was given by the textbooks. So members from Cooperativo Recuerdo taken again these like um, formative texts, if we want to take them as that, had then gone on to produce uh, age-directed uh, textbooks for different uh, ages of school children in the Shinka region, right? So the, so the texts have become also this like dynamic source of pedagogical materials now. Remote work, again, also has opened opportunities for expanding the project since 2020. I've been meeting again with members of Kopshik and Cooperativa El Recuerdo now on a regular basis. And we just finished co-writing a first textbook on Shinka syntax, which is undergoing review by school teachers from the region. And soon we will respond to those reviews to ensure that that textbook that begins looking at the syntax of the language can really be made usable and that it really is a productive text that can then be used hopefully well into the future. And again, with, 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 with an eye towards improvement, probably, right? So 
Some of the challenges is funding. Uh, though the labor of the Shinka Project members today is remunerated by the Guatemalan Ministry of Culture and Sports. So our work since about mid-2021, uh, the Shinka community members uh, who I've been collaborating with remotely, there has been funding available for them to carry out this work from within the Guatemalan uh, government. So in Guatemala, by law, bilingual education has to be supported by the government. So this is one of the ways in which the government has decided to support uh, the Shinka in this project. And I have many opinions about this sort of uh, uh, government funded work, especially given uh, the situation of indigenous communities in Guatemala when it comes to the government, especially the present government. And I'd be happy to talk more about that, but funding has been provided at present at least by the Ministry of Culture. And finally, there do exist empirical gaps in our understanding of Shinka grammar. Basically what this means is that there are certain areas when we get to the complex structures in the language where what we can do today in a reclamation project is to fill in those gaps via grammatical innovations that are informed by what we know about how other languages work. Other languages that have a similar structure to Shinka, then we can fill in those gaps via that broader knowledge about linguistic typology, how languages work in general. Then those empirical gaps can then be filled in order to have a broader coverage of the reclamation project. But this is an ongoing challenge with the project that we'll be working on for many, many years to come. Kami? Thank you all for your attention. I want to acknowledge some people, all the members of Copchiga and Cooperativa del Recuerdo, especially Juan Pablo Lopez, Ramiro Lopez, Felipe de la Cruz, Aleida Montenegro, Cadén de la Cruz, Carlos Lopez, and Demetrio Lopez de la Cruz. Also, funding agencies who have supported this project over the years Davis Projects for Peace, the Strauss Foundation for Mona College, the Ministerio de Cultura y Deportes, Olmay Garcia Mazar, linguist, Kachika linguist, who was a key participant and a key support for me at the beginning of this, of this collaboration. Also Falca Saxe and Chris Rogers and the AISC and the Chancellor's Postdoctoral Scholar Program for giving me a home on which to continue this work. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, before we go to questions, I also want to welcome, I noticed in the chat, Karen de la Cruz. Uh, bienvenidos. I'm so happy that you can be here. Um, so a member of, of the team that Rodrigo has been talking about and Shinka community member as well. Um, so now we'll take any questions, comments, uh, ranging from you know, the content of the talk to questions about your own language revitalization reclamation efforts to anything else in between. So. I will go ahead and moderate if you'd like to use um, the Zoom hand or if you would just like to unmute yourself. I think we're a small enough group that that won't be too crazy. So I welcome your questions. So I think we have a question in the chat. Oh, I'm so sorry. Do you want to read the question out loud, Rodrigo, or would you like me to? Sure, I'll read it. So okay. uh, this is a a uh, question that has a couple different components. Is Shinka evolving to incorporate current words, phrases, ideas, such as computer, cell phone, and emailing? So yes, yeah, so I'll answer that first. So this is always a, a very important concern of communities in this kind of projects that uh, the creation of new words, neologisms that we call them. And yes, so this is something that's been incorporated into the material that we produce because Shinka has a very productive word formation strategies. So you're able to create words from different component parts. So the derivational morphology in the language is quite rich. So in this way, you're able to take the parts of the language for which we have detailed documentation and, and then use those in order to create these new words. Because there is a general um, desire to avoid loan words from Spanish, even if they were to be uh, incorporated into the sound system of Shinka, which is what happens in, 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 many, um, in many situations, right? Loans come in and go from different, from different languages, but the community wants to avoid that, right? So that's one part. Um, many languages lose words, phrases, ideas due to the loss of elders. 
Has this been the case of Shinka and how is this being addressed? So this is an important point that uh, many times um, when, when the many like um, specific phrases or idioms or specific registers of, of a language can then not be, um, one would want to have detailed documentation of those in order to see that they are not lost in, within the process of reclamation. There do exist many recordings that were made with uh, Shinka elders, but those have been a little difficult to access. So we have texts that show the kind of speech of elders, but I would say that it is the case that some, it is not inconceivable that some of these elements of the language uh, are not ac accessible anymore. And one part is about the term accessible. So, right, so I, I've talked about how, how, how to make like the linguistic uh, jargon and the linguistic description accessible to the community. What considerations are being made for the disabled community, deaf, blind, autistic? This is not a, a, a topic that we have developed in detail. I, I, would, I know that since, since the material that we produce is now standard and used, by the Ministry of Education and Cultural and Sports for the teaching of Shinka in the, in the Shinka region. There are also uh, ways in which the ministry addresses the needs of different populations like the disabled community. So I, I wouldn't know immediately if this sort of work has been done for Shinka, but, but I will find out about this. Thank you for that. Okay, we have another question from Joy um, in the chat. How did you become interested in Shinka as an undergraduate and discover the dissertation on the 18th century grammatical manuscript? It seems as though this early interaction drove your linguistic academic path. Yeah, so how did this happen? Well, I, I'm Guatemala and I grew up in Guatemala City and when you, when you, when you're in the school system there, you know, and you're in your social studies class, and there'll be a little section where it says, oh, here are the languages spoken in Guatemala, and here's, here are the Mayan languages, and here's Shinka and Garifuna, and not much else is said, right? Not much else is said, right? So I had it in my mind that Shinka was a distinct linguistic community in Guatemala, and when I, when I got into linguistics as an undergraduate, it was my second year. I had already had the, the chance to be involved in some, some research. And I was chatting with another Guatemalan student in my college, and we were talking about really getting to work, uh, applying what we had been learning. And I just started doing a little research about Chinka. And that's how I ran across Frauke Sachs's then very recent dissertation. Um, and yeah, the, the interaction came off of, of an email interaction, uh, knowing that there were research funds for undergraduates and getting in touch with, with Kopshig and saying, um, it seems that, you know, I could help out in this process. I have these funds to be able to do this work. And that's how it started. And, and then it, it went from there. Then during our second year, that's when we, we Kopshig members and I wrote up uh, proposals for Davis Projects for Peace, the Donald Strauss Foundation, and both foundations supported the project. So the, the funds that were provided then really drew, allowed us to then have a lot of work done that then we brought to the government and said, here's all the work that Kopshig has done. Here's like you can now replicate this within the school system. And this is the sort of philosophy that the community has about how this project should go. And so it really, it was seen as an opportunity for, for the government as well, right? Because then this work had been done from outside funds, right? So that's what, how it got started. Fantastic. We've got some more questions in the chat, one from uh, Alex Ward. Thank you for this presentation. You mentioned focusing on a particular variety of Shinka to standardize and teach. How did Kopshig and you navigate that, that decision? I'll stop there and then you can do the second part later. Very important question, right? Because you wonder, well, I also mentioned, right? That uh, this is coming up later. Uh, 
that really we 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 can talk about different Shinkan languages, right? Because there were very distinct differences. There are very distinct differences between the different Shinkan languages. So when we started working with Kapshik, the, the 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 richest material that existed on which to base a reclamation effort was the reconstructive description by Frau Kasaxi. And that the, the Shinka that's described therein from the 18th century is closest to one of the dialects, one of the modern Shinka dialects, the Guasacapan Shinka. Shinka spoke in the town of Guasacapan. So, so, so you could really see the evolution of the language. And then what's described in that document, centuries old document is really very similar to the, the, the language of the of heritage speakers and the elders in, in modern day Shinka region. So part of the reasoning was practical to standardize the, the, the variety of Shinka that's present in that 18th century document because it was the best description. So it was, in a sense, it was a practical decision. This is the richest uh, material that we have to work with. Interestingly, you might have noticed that I said that this, the, the, the standard that was proposed by Kopshiga and I is not the Shinka spoken in the town Kopshig is based on, Chikimulia. That's not the basis for the standard. And in fact, it was a very difficult decision for the members of Kopshig. It led to a lot of debate among community members when the, the, what I did and what Lolmai Garcia did was to present the available material that we have and to really carve out what could be done for standardizing this or that variety, right? And the decision ultimately was made to go with the richest description that we have. And um, I'm not gonna say that that hasn't led to, to difficulties. I mean, it has, uh, and even different opinions about what should have been done, right? And the second part of the question has to do with the distinctive aspects of the language that you've mentioned, you know, both the syntactic and phonological aspect that you went into very nice detail about. Are those common across varieties? Yeah, so the, so the phonological, um, the, the, the vowel concurrence restriction exists across all varieties, so that's common across all varieties. Um, the, the basic order as well. What really was, what really uh, is one of the, the key ways in which you see the difference is that the, the, the agreement morphemes across varieties are very different. The, the kind of like the structure is the same, but there's been a lot of phonological change in the forms of the agreement morphemes. So that that is what led a lot to that lack of mutual intelligibility. And also sound change among the different varieties led to a lot of differences in the consonantal system as well. So though, so really the differences are not of a very, um, they're not so deep as to say that some of those structural aspects that I went into actually change so much to become not observable in the different variants. Yeah. We have another question in the chat uh, from Pamela Greenman. When you say the recordings of the elders are inaccessible, do you mean the media format is so outdated that you don't have equipment to listen to them? I know of reclamation efforts in 19th century songs that are currently being digitized for future study. Is this possible with Shinka? So part of the inaccessibility comes that, for instance, uh, Lyle Campbell and Terence Kaufman's notes really are, they're not, there are many, many notes, right? But if, if that raw material that the community has, it, there's very little they can do with it, right? So that's what I mean by inaccessible. Even if, if you were, we, uh, even if we have like a, a, you know, it's accessible given our media, like we can have a computer where we can see it, it's not of much use, right? Because the terminology that are used there, the transcriptions that are used there, they need to go through some process in order to be understandable. And so Chris Rogers' dissertation, for instance, which uses those notes, does that work, right? So, so it goes through the notes and then lays out the different grammatical properties of the different Shinka varieties. Right. So, so that work has been done to process those sorts of, 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 of raw notes, let's say. Um, an issue with, 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 with Roger's work, which is very rich and, and part of, and actually has come to inform our project as well, is that um, most of it is in English. So, so at this point, right, there is that language there as well. But it's certainly, it's there 
to inform whatever form either Kapshig's language reclamation efforts take or other members of the Shinka community. Yeah. So that's sort of what I mean by accessible. It's like, you know, well, it always has to go through some, some, some filtering, right, in order to be understandable in a way that makes it practical, usable in a practical way. I want to highlight and welcome uh, another comment in the text from, I believe, uh, another Shinka guest. We're so happy you're here. Bienvenidos. Gracias a todos por estar aquí, Karen, miembros del Kupshi. Gracias. Um, I have a question that uh, builds off of Pamela's about technologies and more about technologies that are being uh, created by you and other members of Kupshi. Um, so, you know, I know you've been involved in the production of textbooks, and if we think of language textbooks just as a genre, you know, right. one of their limitations for years is that they didn't have any um, way for you to listen <laughs> to these materials. And, you know, I'm also an outsider linguist who works with uh, several communities, and within these communities, there's a great interest in and hunger for like technologies that will allow people to hear and record and see, you know, so phones have been quite transformative. But so I'm wondering if do you see either as part of the textbook project, um, the use of recording technologies um, as part of that, or in other parts of the project, do you see people engaging with these kinds of technologies as part of reclamation efforts? Yeah, yeah I I should have put this in the presentation, but there's a Shinka learning app. So there's a there's an app that can be downloaded that that basically takes what's in the textbooks and you then can access on your phone and listen to a recording. So yeah, for sure. So so uh, basically the the that work has become the basis on which these kinds of other means to make the language accessible have now begun to be used as well. Yeah. And um, it, it it's all part of of the of the full picture, right? It's it's not mm -hmm. just textbooks and and being and having the language be taught in the school system right that can be a part of a language recognition effort but it's not the whole part right mm -hmm. having a language learning app can be part of that effort as well right and can really they can inform each other but it, one aspect for instance that i touched on is is having these language workshops with the teachers who use these textbooks so that they're able to familiarize themselves with them and to know how to use them right that has made the process much more productive than if this were just material that was distributed, right? And so, yeah, no, absolutely. That this kinds of uh, newer ways of thinking about this have definitely been at the forefront of the community's mind as well. That's exciting. I would love to take a look at that app if it's appropriate <laughs> for me yeah. to do so. Any other questions? I see someone unmuting. This could be a sign. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I, we can. I, oh, OK. I can't see me, but I can see you guys. And I can hear me. Um, uh, I don't know anything about uh, Shinka, but uh, I've worked a lot in Madagascar. <clears throat> and there, too, you had uh, problems of developing instruction in Malagasy, the native language, as opposed to French, which was the dominant colonial language. Uh, and it has led to a problem that I'm guessing you don't really have. I guess most people in your villages in Shinka speaking areas um, are fluent in Spanish. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so in the Shinka territory, folks have grown up learning Spanish. Yes. I see. So they will learn about Shinka via Spanish, in a sense. Um, it, yeah, which was uh, one thing that led me to think the connection is perhaps not completely clear, but uh, Malagasy is surviving extremely well because it has a property that I think it shares with Shinka, namely uh, its uh, indigenous ability to form new and complex words in adaptation to the extensive, uh, largely administrative vocabulary that comes with developing a bureaucratic society. So this has been a, a big problem. And Malagasy has pretty much solved it. Like you can read a Malagasy newspaper where they will sometimes have a Malagasy word and in parenthesis, 
they'll have the French word to tell you what the Malagasy word means, which sounds kind of funny when I first saw it, but then I realized that the indigenous ways of making up words are not gonna make all the fine distinctions you want between, I don't know, regulation and law and misdemeanor. You'll need some French explanation, but still the result has been that uh, the, uh, education level in Malagasy has increased uh, very considerably since I've been working uh, there. So I'm encouraged to hear that uh, Shinka is a bit like this in that it looks like it has the indigenous mechanisms to adapt to vocabulary increase, which yes. all languages need today, okay? Not just uh, understudied ones or something. Yeah, if no, I look at French, I they complain can, about how much English is coming in all the time. Yeah, I think we can make the connection to the, the question that was made about neologisms, right? Like the community wants yeah. words that fit their needs, and this includes many new technologies, new, new, new words, and then having the resources from the language be able to give you those words. And in Shinka, you're able to do that. The, the language possesses the, those resources to create those words. Oh, thank you. Well, we are nearing the end of our time together. Is there one last small question? I'm happy to, to answer any other questions you all might have. Questions, criticisms? No, <laughs> no <laughs> criticisms. I will, can I add a little comment slash plug? Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who are interested in talking about language reclamation efforts, either in Mesoamerica or um, in North America, you know, please um, reach out to us at the center. You know, we have a lot of faculty and students who are able to offer their own their own expertise in this. Um, we have a we're going to hear now from Karen de la Cruz. So go ahead, Karen. Hola, licenciada Karen, ¿cómo está? Ran Langum, uh, Dr. Rodrigo, uh, I don't speak English, no puedo hablar inglés, eh, pero de verdad, eh, si usted les puede traducir, doctor, agradecerles eh, especialmente a usted. Sé que eh, a través de usted el aporte para visibilizar el idioma Xinca, para fortalecerlo, no contamos con una persona con el expertise que usted tiene. Se lo he dicho en diferentes oportunidades. Usted no tiene sangre Xinca, pero tiene corazón Xinca. Y de verdad eso es de, de agradecerle eh, desde el fondo de nuestro corazón. Porque a través de sus aportes, de, de, ese, de esa entrega que usted tiene, eh, de verdad, nosotros hemos podido levantarnos. Hemos salido de, de ese olvido que por años hemos estado. Y lamentablemente los compañeros que han estado en todo el proceso no, no pudieron estar el día de hoy por diferentes situaciones, pero eh, créame que eh, están con usted, están siempre eh, apoyándolo, así como usted nos entrega eh, día a día un mensaje, un, eh, una llamada. Usted siempre está pendiente de nosotros, doctor, como de verdad somos hermanos, nos solidarizamos en todo. Usted sabe que es uno de los principios que nosotros tenemos como pueblo y de verdad no hay palabras para agradecerle. Gracias a todos ustedes también. Ragnacum, Kurajli, Ayajli, Pastanay. Gracias, Cami, licenciada. Um, so I'm going to interpret a little bit of that. I'm not going to interpret the, the parts that I feel a little self-conscious about, but uh, <laughs> Karen was thanking the attendees for coming today and also uh, thanking me for uh, this presentation on the Shinka culture and, and language and talking about how um, this kind of work and the work that I've had the privilege to do has supported the community and, and continues to do so. And uh, yeah, Pachtanay Licenciado, muchas gracias, thank you. And I think we have somebody else. Mm -hmm. Huawei, I might be mispronouncing. I think that is the Ral Nangun, estimado doctor Rodrigo, le saluda Claudina de la Cruz. Hola, Claudina, ¿cómo estás? 
Bien, gracias a Dios, es un gusto y un placer poderles saludar a través de este medio. Ahí les disculpas con el nombre del dispositivo, ¿verdad? Que se me escapó cambiar. Entonces, well, este... Well, we're just apologizing for the name, for having the cell phone name instead of her name. Yeah. <laughs> Eh, bien, como decía la licenciada Karen, pues desde el pueblo Xinca, de todo corazón, nosotros le agradecemos a su persona, a doctor Rodrigo. Sabemos que la lucha ha sido una lucha desde ya hace varios años, ¿verdad? Y prácticamente desde que usted está, ¿verdad? Este proceso, pues, se ha venido haciendo un proceso reivindicativo, ¿verdad? Eh, pues yo estuve los primeros años, ¿verdad? Cuando se inició el proceso en el año 2012. Y pues actualmente es un proceso que venimos aprendiendo, ¿verdad? Constantemente porque la lucha que se va dando pues es una lucha que no solo eh, vendrá para el proceso reivindicativo idiomático, sino que también para muchas generaciones, ¿verdad? Para que el pueblo se siga levantando de una u otra manera, ¿verdad? Agradecerles y saludos cordiales desde los compañeros de Copsuit, especialmente de Juan Pablo, ¿verdad? Que no pudo estar con usted sí, en este momento. Saludos. Saludos. Gracias, Rodrigo. Saludos cordiales. Eh, Claudina uh, was one of the original members of the group uh, when we started working in 2012. So she's talking about how this ongoing project, this project is still ongoing, the right, no, the fight not only for the linguistic rights of the, of the Xinca folks, but also for their cultural reclamation. And yeah, sending you all uh, uh, a hello from, from Chiquimulia, from Xinca land, so. Oh, wonderful. Thank you all so much. Y muchísimas gracias, nuestros amigos. Um, yeah, we are out of time, but that was such a wonderful event. And please, everyone, join me in a round of applause, whether virtual, visual, otherwise. Thank, Thank you so you much, all. Rodrigo. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you. For the discussion, and I'm happy to keep the discussion going. If you have any questions or anything, send me an email. My, my info, you can just... Just Google me, you'll find me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>